So anyway, uh, a couple questions on the sticky board here. Someone was first asking for the hep C meds. We need to know specifically like what their mechanism is, what proteins they're hitting. I would know that, right? Because you need to know in terms of how they're going to be working synergistically together. You wouldn't want two meds that are doing basically the same job because you don't get any additional benefit out of that. Um, so I would at least know that detail there of like which proteins are working on specifically. Uh, in terms of uh, questions, I had a person. A right, person had a question about using Versed uh, and, and some discrepancies between dosing. This is kind of one of those things you get a feel for as you're working that, um, you know, you may see more common doses, but this may be dependent on the provider and who's doing it. Some people will be a little bit more aggressive. So I see some people that automatically go to like 0.3 mg per kilo. Some people will do less. It really just depends. Honestly, I don't see a ton of people doing Versed for RSI in the first place, mainly because it just doesn't really give you as deep of a sedation as something like Natomidate or Propofol or Ketamine. Um, so that's just one thing to, to kind of note with that. But um, as long as you're within like a typical dosing range, I'm not going to dock you for points for that. Um, as long as it's not something like to where you give one milligram per kilogram because that would be way too much, right? So if it's any like obvious over or under dosing, then that's when I get a little bit more specific with that. Okay. All right, so hopefully this, uh, our, our chat box is not going to obscure the PowerPoint too much, but let me know if it's a problem. You guys can see everything okay? All right, very good. Um, anyway, so we were discussing some of our creepy crawlies that we have here in Florida. We talked about our um, uh, snakes, right? Remember, we had the two main categories. You had your pit vipers, which is all like your rattlesnakes and water moccasins. We then had our... Um, uh, we then had our elapidae, which includes the eastern coral snakes. Remember, there's two different antivenoms we use for those because they are quite different in terms of the venom that they're producing. And it's good to know kind of what different things to expect. With like the pit vipers, there's going to be a lot of swelling. You see a lot of coagulopathy. With the elapidae or the coral snakes, mainly neurotoxic, right? You're going to see a lot of paralysis associated with that. Um, you know, dysarthria, respiratory failure, prestigios, those are the kind of things you normally expect to see. Now, to get into some more. Uh, insect varieties here, we have our caterpillars. We have four main varieties here in Florida that are of toxicologic concern. We have one that's called the saddleback for obvious reasons, kind of looks like it's a saddle. There's the uh, pus or the puce uh, caterpillar here. We have the io moth, and then we have the hag, which I, don't, I guess someone is having a bad day when they name that one, I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, so the problem here with these is not the fact that they have like a nasty bite or anything, it's these spines that they have. And so if you see a fuzzy caterpillar, um, it's best to avoid them typically. However, you do see some accidental envenomations when, uh, for instance, like one falls out of a tree or something. Or I was just at the park the other day with my kids uh, and I looked down and I had this little fuzzy guy crawling on my leg and so I swatted him off real quick and didn't have any stings. But um, it's the hairs that are really gonna be the problem here. So if someone goes like, maybe like was whacking it or something, they can get that in their hand. Uh, and so not only is it sort of the direct physical irritation due to this piercing the skin, also some of the toxins that are included uh, on the spines as well cause um, a lot of pain. And just to give you an example of um, how this can appear, and, and uh, the, the clinical name for this is called lepidopterism. So again, another way you can wow your friends with your obscure medical knowledge. Uh, but this is basically the signs and symptoms that are consistent with a caterpillar sting like this. And so one of the things you'll see here is pain, and it's oftentimes out of proportion to what the actual site looks like, right? So if you have someone who got bit by a rattlesnake, it's going to look really bad. It's going to be really uh, have a ton of ecchymosis, very swollen. The patient's going to be complaining about pain. You can see that and be like, yeah, you're probably, you probably need some morphine or fentanyl or something. These things are going to be looking pretty much like nothing. I mean, they may have a little bit of redness or maybe a little bit of swelling, but beyond that, the patient is going to be in a ton of pain because this stuff can be um, just really, really sensitizing those little nociceptive fibers there. And so I had a case where I had a, um, probably like a 13 year old who was coming into the ER and this guy was like crying out in the waiting room. He was in so much pain and his mom was like, he's faking it. He's faking it. This little caterpillar did not do this. And I was like, no, 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 this is consistent. And it took like two rounds of morphine just to get his pain somewhat manageable. So again, when people are coming up complaining of pain like this and you look at it and be like, oh, it's probably nothing, um, they, that could be legitimate. And so um, that's just one example of that. Other things, you may see some local swelling, uh, tingling, numbness, that sort of thing there. Um, and then in terms of just because of all that pain, you can have some vomiting associated with that, so that's not too uncommon. Um, rarely, you may have the eyes or throat being affected, but this is oftentimes not the case. Typically, it's more of a dermal sort of reaction, and, and some allergic reactions are possible as well. So how do we decontaminate these patients? You can use our old friend duct tape. Duct tape fixes everything, and it actually helps to treat this as well. Um, so this is kind of cool. You can use any sort of adhesive, and you can put this over the site and actually pull out all of those little hairs. So obviously, put the sticky side to the area that's affected, 
that'll help pull out those little spines and hopefully prevent any further sort of exposure from that standpoint. And then of course, wash it off with soap and water, good wound care. Um, you can use antihistamines to help out with any sort of allergic reactions there. You crack out the medical duct tape. I mean, I'm sure they're gonna get paid, a, or uh, it's gonna cost a whole lot more for the, the medical variety of duct tape than, than regular, but you could use either potentially. Um, you can do things like applying ice, Antihistamines can help out some allergic reactions here, but um, really opioids may be needed in, in a lot of cases here. So again, don't take someone's pain as um, not being uh, legitimate just because the injury doesn't look that bad, right? Um, and of course, allergic reactions, we've, we've talked about how to manage those in the past as well. So um, just a little quick one. Next we have our spider envenomation. So we have two main types of spiders we're gonna talk about here. And unfortunately, there's a lot of injuries, not injuries, but there's a lot of um, complaints that get uh, ascribed to spiders, which actually are probably not really spiders. So there's always something we, we like to talk about called the MRSA spider. Like I got bit by a spider, I have this huge boil on my butt now. I'm like, that's just MRSA. Like that's, that's <laughs> probably not a spider, unless there's like a little MRSA spider going around biting people and causing <laughs> abscesses. So um, again, not to say that it should not be a spider, but oftentimes it's just your typical run of the mill sort of skin infection, abscess sort of thing. The two main varieties we're going to talk about here include the Lactrodectus mactans, which is the black widow, uh, and the Loxicelles reclusa, which is the brown recluse. These are the two main varieties that you may find here in Florida. Um, now, all spiders themselves, for the most part, are venomous. However, most lack the ability to actually cause any danger to humans, mostly because their fangs are not long enough or strong enough to actually break through human skin. Um, however, these two in particular tend to be a little bit more problematic. And again, I'm trying to talk. Uh, just to talk about the things that are common in Florida because again, that's where we're practicing, even though your mileage may vary if you go elsewhere. Um, but as I mentioned, the, the actual envenomations are really difficult to ascertain because of the fact that you may have an unreliable history. Again, they could have an actual infection that's going on here that you may need to rule out. Uh, and oftentimes they may not even see the spider, right? They may say, okay, well, I, I feel like it was a spider. I think it was, but it scurried off and I have no idea what it was. Doesn't really help us out a whole lot and from that standpoint. And then again, there's just a lot of propagation of misinformation. Everyone's probably heard of a brown recluse bite and how bad it can be. And so they think, you know, they have an abscess, oh, it must be a brown recluse, right? Even though in Florida, you're gonna find it's much less common than you might actually would, would think. So we're gonna talk about the Lactrodectus mactans first. Now there's several varieties out there. It's not just the black widow, which obviously has a very um, notable sort of hourglass shape on its um, on thorax there, but we have things like the southern black widow, there's a red widow, there's brown widows, different varieties here. Um, you will find that typically the females are responsible for most of the in, um, injuries, mainly because the males are much smaller, so they're not really able to cause much injury there. Um, so the females are the ones that you typically worry about. And they like to form, you know, these kind of erratic webs in places like you know, garages and sheds and things like that. So oftentimes people, even though these are naturally shy uh, spiders, people are like reaching their hands in somewhere or they're cleaning out the garage and they can accidentally get a bite from this. So, um, and actually if you were to look at their venom on a milligram per milligram basis, this is way more potent than any pit viper that you're gonna run into. However, if you can do the comparative size between the two, this really can't inject a whole lot of venom as compared to like a big, you know, Eastern Diamondback or something. Um, so what you're gonna see locally is, you know, some pain patients will be reporting. You're gonna see maybe a pair of red spots develop because of the little fangs. You may, may see it, may not. Um, and then we'll see that the local effects are generally pretty limited. You know, besides maybe a little redness swelling, not a whole lot you're gonna see there. The problem though is we have this thing called alpha latrotoxin, uh, which is gonna be injected. Uh, and this is gonna be causing this like opening of these really non-specific cation channels. So we're gonna see some neuromuscular involvement with this. Um, you're gonna see this influx of calcium and we're gonna see a lot of muscle spasming associated with this, right? So you're having all these skeletal muscle being activated and so you can see it tend to tense up. Um, not only that, but we're gonna be releasing things like acetylcholine and norepinephrine, which is gonna be influencing some of the side effects that we're gonna see from this. So what do we call the clinical syndrome of being bitten by a, a widow. Um, lactrodectism is the name there. I'm probably not gonna put that on the test, but is this lepidopterism, lactrodectism? I'm not gonna get that specific, but just for your knowledge sake. Um, the bite will typically be painful. Um, you can see by three to four hours or so, you start to get these like cramping and fasciculations. Typically it's localized to the muscle that was affected or to the limb that was affected, whether it be you know the arm, leg, wherever happened, the bite happen to occur there, uh, and in some cases can actually progress to like a board-like rigidity in really rare cases. Um, I actually had one case where um, we had an infant that was actually bitten by a black widow and had some like very severe muscle contractions associated with this, also had some very severe hypertension 
because you're releasing all this norepinephrine and acetylcholine. So this patient was, you know, a baby having very severe hypertension related to this bite. It's all the spider and everything. It's like really classic sort of story. Um, so I'll tell you how we treated that in just a moment. Other things that can occur include uh, tachycardia, the hypertension I mentioned. Um, they get a regional diaphoresis, which is pretty wild. You'll see like the affected limb is the only thing that's sweating. Everything else will be bone dry except for that, which is kind of odd. Um, you know, nausea, vomiting, it rarely will you see respiratory arrest. This is typically very small patients. You might be more likely to see that, or maybe more severe uh, bite, but it's very rare. What do we do for this? ABCs. You know, uh, probably seeing a lot more of that, especially with your emergency medicine stuff and the trauma sim and all of that. ABCs are critical, um, but um, pretty straightforward for these patients here. Good wound care. Uh, we may update their tetanus if they don't know when the last one was or if they're within the time frame for it. Uh, and then provide analgesia. This is another one that's pretty painful, so you know, busting out the opioids is totally appropriate for these type of patients. So we used to use IV calcium, and that was thought to help out with the muscle contractions and some of the, the uh, rigidity associated with this, but it's pretty transient, so I don't see too many people recommend it anymore. Although I'm sure if you look it up like in uh, pants prep pearls or something like that, it'll say, like, oh, give calcium, but clinically it doesn't do us a whole lot of good. More often than not, what we can do um, is provide some muscle relaxants in the form of things like benzodiazepines. So things like diazepam, lorazepam tend to be pretty effective for helping out to kind of relax those patient's muscles to some degree, which can be, um, you know, again, it will help to relieve a lot of that pain because that's why they're experiencing it. Um, and then typically within 24 to 40 hours, most patients should be recovering there. Now we do have an antivenom. This is another equine-derived antivenom. Do you guys remember what, what the risk of using like a full equine antibody is? Anaphylaxis, yeah. So anaphylaxis is a huge risk for those patients there. Yeah, thank you, Jackson. Um, so you can see that anytime using that full antibody from another animal source, that's a, a risk. So just like with the coral snake antivenom that we use, we have the same risk that's here. Um, and so that's why we like to hold off on it. In fact, I don't know that I've ever seen a vial in person, even though we've used it very rarely, but Typically, we'll use this for patients who are really resistant to all other treatments, or if you have very old, very young, or pregnant patients. So in that case of that 10-month-old, I think I think it was 10 months old, uh, that baby was having hypertension, some serious rigidity, that would definitely met the criteria for needing to use that antivenom. So what we do in those cases, when we know there's a high likelihood of them having um, a reaction, sometimes what we can do is a skin test, where we can actually take a small dilution of the antivenom, place it underneath the skin to see if they get a wheel and flare reaction. But again, if you really need antivenom, sometimes you got to treat through, even if you know they're going to have a reaction. But at least you can pre-treat with things like steroids and antihistamines and, and things like that. So that's one way you can kind of get around that. Um, this would be a non-venomous pig, just FYI. Okay. Um, the other one here is going to be the brown recluse, um, also known as the fiddleback spider. So if you ever got close enough to one, you can see a tiny little fiddle back there. Although, I, again, I recommend not getting that close to find it. Um, now, you know, I think probably contrary to a lot of popular opinion, these are not really native to Florida. You can find them throughout most of the southeast, however, they don't naturally live here in Florida. But that doesn't mean you can't have nests that occur here. This is usually due to hitchhikers, right? So they'll get into someone's clothes or their luggage or something like that, they come back here and then they can potentially set up a small nest. So again, it's not uncommon or not unheard of that you'd have a brown recluse bite, but you probably have a lot more people complaining of those bites than our actual spiders here in the state, right? Unless you had some really malicious spider going around biting people on purpose, but generally they're reclusive, brown recluse, right? So they, they're not really looking to go out there and bite people on purpose. Um, so they typically live like in dark areas, they're usually only out at nighttime, and most often the bites are gonna be defensive, meaning someone's reaching in somewhere, didn't know the spider was there, then they get bit. It's sort of the most common thing you'll see there. So, um, what do you get? So the reason why people like are really worried about this is because it can be pretty nasty if you do get a true bite here. So we get this necrotic arachnidism. Again, that's my, that's a, my uh, metal band's name back in high school. It's pretty, we're, we're pretty good. Um, but you will see that the venom contains things like hyaluronidase, the sphingomyelinase D, and it basically just like wrecks all this tissue you're gonna see there. And so you're gonna see this big uh, lesion. Here's an example of one right here, uh, where basically they get this bullseye lesion. Right, so they're gonna have sort of a red core, they'll have sort of a blue um, ish, sort of area of ecchymosis around that and then white blanching around that. Um, and again, it's all just tissue necrosis. So and there's not a whole lot we can do about that, unfortunately, because some people are like, well, if that's where the venom is, let's just cut it out, let's excise it. It doesn't help because it can then spread to those further borders there. So honestly, the best thing is just to provide good wound care. There's not a ton we can do for that, unfortunately. Um, but you can see some more systemic symptoms like fever, chills, malaise, things like that. Uh, rarely, and I've seen this a few times in very young patients, or at least reported, um, they can get hemolysis related to this as well. Not common, but you can see that. 
um, and this coagulopathy can go along with that as well. So those are more the rare severe cases, but this is something, if you get a true bite, this is again what it's gonna progress into. You gotta take good care of it, otherwise you get secondary infections and, and things like that, unfortunately. So uh, again, tetanus prophylaxis, wound care, nothing specific here. We don't, uh, unfortunately, we don't really have uh, an antivenom for this to really stop that, unfortunately. Um, there's some thought, there's a drug called Dapsone, which has been used uh, from a couple of different disease states. You may see it used for things like um, some opportunistic infections, you know, things like that, but uh, it's a rarely used drug, uh, but this may be able to help prevent some of the severity associated with those ulcers. No clinical trials, because we can't really do randomized controlled trials of like having people get bitten by these uh, spiders and then you know, give half of them Dapsone and half of them not and see what happens, you can't do that. Um, so at least case reports are, are kind of the best thing that we have to say like, well, maybe it helped, no, we don't really know. So. As I mentioned, no uh, antivenom currently available for this. Um, there is the potential use for hyperbaric oxygen. Do you guys know what that is? So it's basically placing the patient into a chamber and then you increase the uh, atmospheric pressure within that chamber. You can go like two and a half to three times normal atmospheric um, uh, pressures. And what that does is it concentrates oxygen. So you may see this a lot for different uh, types of wound care. They'll recommend using hyperbaric oxygen because it gets this really oxygen rich environment um, that has been shown to be uh, helpful for wound care. So there's some thought that may be useful here as well. Uh, we sometimes will do hyperbaric oxygen for uh, carbon monoxide poisoning, although it's fairly rare. Um, again, it's, it's uh, few and far in between. You find actual hyperbaric chambers and there's a lot of challenges that go along with that. Um, but again, I don't wanna get too far into the weeds from, from that uh, standpoint. Yeah, the, they're, they look like, so there are different types of hyperbaric chambers. You can find some that are like monotubes or monostations where basically it looks like an acrylic tube you're putting in the patient, like a coffin almost. You can increase the pressure. Then they have big multi-place chambers. It looks like a giant tin can or something, probably like the size of like this, you know, probably from like the door to here and probably, you know, to the second row desk or something. Uh, and you can actually have people in there with the patient that will dive with them. It's called diving because it's kind of like when you're, you know, diving underwater, that pressure goes up like that. Um, but basically it'll, um, you get people in there that could like, you know, provide medications and, and do whatever else they need to do. So it's pretty cool if you ever uh, wanna look into it. Um, Marley was asking, any form of antibiotics recommended for brown recluse bites? Brother got uh, bit by one 15 plus years ago and his arm got so infected, swollen, I'm pretty sure he's put on antibiotic. Right, so I think from like an empiric standpoint, probably not recommended, right? If you notice there's maybe like a secondary infection kind of going along with that, then you're typically thinking like normal skin stuff like Bactrim, um, you know, Vanco for like really severe cases, um, things like that. But I don't know of anything other than topical antibiotics like your bacitracins and whatnot. Probably not gonna recommend systemic antibiotic therapy for that. As long as you can keep good wound care and keep it clean, um, hopefully that will be good. But again, take a while for these to kind of resolve on their own. So again, that risk for infection does go up with time, so. Questions here. Okay, and then I think the last section here I'm gonna be talking about are gonna be our marine envenomations. Um, not like we have like poisonous like military personnel, but actual uh, fishes and, and things like that and uh, jellyfish. Um, first off, I want to talk about Nidaria, family of Nidaria. This is including a lot of your uh, jellyfish and things like that, right? I'm sure most people have seen Finding Nemo. You don't know, have to touch the, touch the tentacles, but the tops are okay. Um, but this is kind of what we're referring to. Um, and again, why do we care about marine envenomations in Florida? to the ocean, relatively speaking, and some of you might be at the ocean working, and so it's not uncommon to run into these um, or get calls about them you know, uh, you know, pretty frequently there. So what happens, they have these little nematocysts, which are pretty cool because, not for the patient, but they're pretty cool because they have these like little stingers in here that when um, they have some sort of trigger, whether it be pressure, osmolality, pH, some change happens that causes them to release this stinger out, and then that can inject its whatever venom it happens to be carrying there. And so, um, as I mentioned, a lot of things can be affected in this, whether it be chemicals, pressure, osmotic changes. So again, when you imagine, for instance, uh, someone gets uh, hit with a uh, jellyfish in the middle of the ocean, they come out, all of a sudden they're like in this fresh air environment, that can sometimes cause the stingers to, to release there from those nematocysts. And you can see, you know, kind of on an electron, micro, electron microscope that, you know, these things look pretty nasty. You can imagine them getting hooked into the skin pretty easily there. So a couple of different types we can run into. So for instance, there's the Cubozoa. These are not true jellyfish, so to speak, but they still contain those nematocysts we talked about. Um, and these typically are associated with the most morbidity and mortality. Fortunately, we don't run into these a lot in Florida. However, if you ever wanted to be adventurous and go out and practice in Australia, perhaps, you may run into these. Uh, this includes the box jellyfish and then the irukandji jellyfish. I'm only kind of listing these because again, um, could you run into them potentially in Florida? Rarely, perhaps, but uh, again, these are good things that might come up like on board style questions or something, you know, you never know. 
uh, when, when these questions come up. Uh, more commonly, though, we'll certainly see in Florida, we have the Portuguese man o' war. Um, so we'll see these, and actually they're not, again, not true jellyfish, but actually these colonies of organisms together, but they still can cause very similar effects to other jellyfish there. Um, other ones include like the blue bottle, um, and you can see the tentacles there can be over 100 feet in some cases, so fairly long. You imagine a lot of skin exposure could happen if someone were to run into that on accident, right? Uh, other ones include things like the lion's mane, the sea nettle, uh, the anemones also fit into this category as well, right? Um, and again, you can see those long like wreaths and things like that, you know, the clown, you know, get little um, Nemo and his, and his dad, Marlin? Marlin, yes. Um, <laughs> having to be immune to that, but we are not, unfortunately, so we want to probably avoid those anemones whenever possible. So um, what's going to be happening here is that the, the venom that's included in these little nematocysts include things that can cause uh, hemolysis, they can cause dermal necrosis, they can cause a lot of damage depending on sort of the dose that you're getting. Uh, in some cases it can cause things like nerve conduction uh, blockade, almost like a local anesthetic sort of effect, and cause cardiovascular collapse. Um, these are not common things that can occur because most commonly you're going to see a lot of pain, irritation, swelling, and I'll show you some pictures here in a second of what that normally would look like. Um, but certainly you can see these in, in more severe cases, especially in smaller patients as well. Um, the ear congee is also really interesting because it causes like really massive catecholamine release. And so you can imagine they're going to get like a lot of hypertension, tachycardia associated with that. Um, here's an example of what a sting would look like. And you can definitely see the normal tentacle looking patterns there. So if you see that, that's like almost very obviously going to be something like a jellyfish. Uh, unless, unless it was like a cat of nine tails or something they're being whipped with or I don't know. But Anyway, um, most of the time the stings are not going to cause systemic symptoms, as I sort of mentioned already, but severe pain is going to be uh, listed here, uh, or going to be uh, definitely mentioned here. Uh, you get those erythematous linear rashes. If you hear that description, you may want to think about something like that, especially if they're out of the ocean, right? Um, systemically speaking, you see things like muscle spasms, nausea, vomiting associated with this. Those are probably the more common things uh, that you run into there. Um, just to kind of highlight, uh, the more dangerous ones, including that box jellyfish, this one's pretty wild uh, because uh, there's been case reports of people who even get stung when they're in the water and then by the time they try to walk out of the ocean to get back to shore, they basically pass out, they syncopize, uh, and they may end up even drowning in some cases, right? It can be really, really severe, even though there's a very tiny little box jellyfish that kind of skip through most of those nets that they have out there in a lot of the Australian beaches and stuff. Um, they can develop this paralysis syncope that can be associated with this. Um, and again, as I mentioned, most patients don't even end up making it to shore, which is why it's, you know, again, really want to make sure people are checking for things like advisories, that there happen to be a lot of them that happen to be out there at the time. And, and kids are going to obviously be more vulnerable because they're getting a bigger milligram per kilo, kilo dose versus an adult patient. Uh, with the ear congee, they can even get the ear congee syndrome. And so as I mentioned, that's where you're going to get that catecholamine surge. You get a lot of tachycardia, you get a lot of diaphoresis, palpitations associated with this. And my favorite symptom ever, the impending sense of doom. Like, I'm sure most of you guys feel that like right before tests. You know, probably like right at 825, you get that impending sense of doom. That's what they're feeling like, probably even worse, than I imagine. Uh, and you can see some severe back spasms as well associated with that. Um, the Portuguese man war, which we're going to find more commonly over here, uh, at least in Florida, again, you're going to find a lot of severe pain associated with that. Uh, from some a systemic standpoint, not a ton, but you can see things like this, like back pain, lacrimation, nasal discharge, you know, kind of like getting this over, um, uh, you know, over uh, stimulation of your acetylcholine system, both on the nicotinic side and the muscarinic side to some degree, um, and rarely can it cause things like renal failure, shock, and death, but it has been at least noted. Uh, another kind of interesting thing uh, we'll see here is something called sea bather's eruption. And so this is related to the larvae of this one particular organism, which I'm not going to try to say because I'll just kind of uh, stumble over it for 10 minutes. Um, but what's kind of interesting with this one is that the larvae actually get into your bathing suit when you're out there swimming. Uh, and so what oftentimes happens is that patients will put their bathing suits back on and wherever the contact is the tightest, which is normally around areas of like elastic, right? So if you have like an elastic waist or something, you'll see these organisms will then start to uh, cause this pyritic eruption that occurs there. So again, you get that pattern is very clearly going to be where their bathing suit was basically. So for instance, here you see it was around where their bathing suit top was. Um, this person happened to have some back uh, manifestations there, but typically you'd see it like around the waistlines, especially. Um, you get that like at least in male patients who typically don't have tops on. Um, uh, again, just another thing to note with that, um, you know, if patients going kind of complaining about that and you see that typical pattern, again, like antihistamines, NSAIDs, things like that are typically going to be used. Average duration, less than two weeks, so it should resolve on its own pretty easily there. So what do we do about these, um, these jellyfish? If someone came out of the water and they had jellyfish tentacles still on them, what do you do about that? 
What does society tell you? Yeah, society says you pee on it. Again, it's a good test of friendship. Are you willing to pee on me if I was exposed to a jellyfish? Or would you do that for your friends? Um, I would actually recommend probably not peeing on it, actually. Um, what's interesting is that in some cases you can find that difference in because the urine is, is obviously of a certain pH, a different uh, osmolality, it can actually cause a nematocyst to fire. So you may actually be peeing on your friend and causing it to be, be even worse, so uh, kind of adding insult to injury, so to speak. Um, so in that case there, I probably would not avoid that, or probably would avoid that. Some people say, like, well, pour beer on it or something if you had some at the beach, you know, pour a Corona on it. Probably not going to help out too much from that standpoint. There has been one thing that actually is a commercial product, uh, which most people prob probably don't have, but it could be available uh, depending on the area. Uh, it's called Stingos, and actually has this aluminum sulfate and the surfactant that is able to help uh, prevent the nematocyst from firing and allows for easier uh, removal of uh, the tentacles from, from the skin there. Typically, though, the best thing you can do is to try to use some kind of lubrication and some sort of like uh, almost like a squeegee like device to try to get the tentacles off to prevent any further nematocysts from uh, affecting the patient there. So, for instance, they're coming out of the water, you're like just happen to be standing there, like you know, say you're uh, on your off day and someone comes out of the water and say, Oh, I got a tentacle on me, what can I do? And you can use seawater, right? Because seawater is what it normally is in anyway. And then you use some kind of credit card and you just kind of uh, scrape those off, and that way you prevent any further exposure. Um, if you were in, say, the hospital setting, someone got transported over, again, pretty nice working at a hospital right at the beach. I had, uh, did that during rotations. I had two months I spent out at, uh, at a hospital right by Jack's Beach. It's like two blocks from the water. And I had this one pharmacist, he's my preceptor, who would go surfing during his lunch break and then come back and just still covered in sand and stuff with his lap coat on. It's good to go. And it's like, wow, it's pretty, pretty wild. But anyway, but if they did come to the ER, then something like a Vaseline or some sort of lubricant could be useful to help kind of uh, get rid of that. So as you can do from that standpoint. Um, there is a box jellyfish antivenom. Obviously, you're not going to be able to find it here too easily because you just don't have a lot of the jellyfish, and maybe over in Australia you'll find that. Um, and again, it's hard to tell. Does it really provide mortality benefits because it happens so rarely that it's like, okay, well, is it gonna we don't know who, who it would have kept from dying versus not, um, but it has been used, and it's kind of similar to other antivenoms we've seen here. Um, interestingly enough, other things you could also use include like verapamil and magnesium can help out with some of the sort of um, neurologic findings you can see there, some of the hypertension, tachycardia, et cetera, uh, can be helped out with that. So kind of interesting. So we also do have some uh, venomous fish. So if any Steve Irwin fans are out there, hopefully I don't offend anyone, but there are stingray talks that's going to be happening here. Um, and basically you can see that um, uh, the spines on a lot of these fish can be pretty problematic here. It's not like they have like, you know, venom in their bites or anything. It's usually the spines. Um, you see this a lot either in patients who are perhaps like walking out in the water. So for instance, with like stingrays, they have that barb that comes out of their tail that they whip up. So if you accidentally step on one, that's how you get sting stung with those typically. Or we see this a lot with like handlers. So for instance, if you have a nice um, exotic sort of aquarium, you may have some of these like lion's fish or something in there and then during handling or something, they get stuck with one of the spines. That's where you get the envenomation actually occurring there. So in addition to physical injury, you also get some of the, the actual chemical injury as well, depending on what sort of um, what sort of venom they have on those spines there. Um, so as I mentioned, most of the stingray um, deaths that you see are more oftentimes going to be related to trauma, as we saw in the case of Steve Irwin, versus something like the actual venom itself. So just one thing to kind of note with that. Um, and then as I mentioned with the spiny fish, like your lionfish and things like that, it's more often like collectors, fishermen, waders, things like that. Uh, and you will find them pretty frequently in Florida, especially down in the Gulf and, and the Keys and things like that. Um, we get a, the majority of these calls are going to be due to the lionfish, mainly because it's the handlers. Really more than anything else is what I get these calls for. And again, a lot of providers don't see these things very often, so that's why they end up calling us in the first place, because they're like, well, do I need to do antibiotics? Do I need to do anything like this, you know? Um, most recent time I had a case like that, we got a call about a, uh, a gator venom, or not gator envenomation, but a gator bite that had happened, and they're like, do we need to do anything about this? And we're like, we're the poison center, but it's a gator, I don't think they're venomous, but we still could provide some recommendations on antibiotics and things, because, you know, the organisms might be in the fishes, uh, spines or, a, or alligator's mouth are going to be different than if it was like, say, a dog or something. So the antibiotics do change up a little bit from that standpoint. Anyway, um, so what we can see from things like stingrays, uh, you can actually have a release of a lot of things like phosphodesterases, serotonin, amino acids uh, that cause this uh, bradycardia and vasoconstriction. So sort of like a decreased heart rate, increased blood pressure. Uh, can also see things like seizures occasionally, but again, pretty rare. More often than not, it's a physical injury that's more concerning there. With the scorpandia, which is all the, the uh, kind of that containing things like the um, uh, stonefish, the lionfish, things like that, um, there's a couple of different varieties of toxins they have available. Things like stonus toxin, uh, veruca toxin, and uh, tachylinicin. Uh, um, 
And so basically these kind of various effects you're gonna see here. So for instance, like with the uh, sonus toxin here, you can actually find that the venom can actually cause pores in membranes of your cells, which can lead to things like edema and hypotension, because all of a sudden you start third spacing fluid out of your blood vessels, for instance. Uh, not only that, you can also see some homolysis associated with that as well, right? Um, for instance, with the Veruca toxin, you can see blockage of calcium channels, which could be affecting things like your blood pressure, it could be affecting uh, things like your contractility of the heart, things like that can be affected as well. So a lot of different effects that can be seen here, and again, some of this is going to be specific to the type of fish. So hopefully, if someone is uh, coming in for one of these stings, if they were like a collector, you at least have a good story in terms of like, what fish it was specifically versus if it was someone who's like out waiting or something and they got stung by something, then they might not have a good of a story. You might not have the fish there uh, to be able to see what specifically it was. So anyway, with the uh, stepping on the stingray, again, it causes that reflex of that barb to kind of shoot out of their tail that they can whip up. Um, so you can see a lot of local edema, cyanosis, and erythema, because again, that vasoconstriction happening there, uh, along with some tissue necrosis and ulceration. And then rarely you can see some more of those systemic sort of signs and symptoms like fasciculations and whatnot. Um, stonefish typically are gonna be pretty painful uh, when you end up seeing that. Um, so you can see this rapid wound cyanosis and edema that forms around the area um, and pretty slow to heal for the most part. So again, I'm just kind of showing you guys this stuff, not to like memorize this for years down the road, but again, look this stuff up if you have a question. If you're like, oh yeah, I heard I got stung by a stonefish. Oh yeah, I remember hearing something about that. I should probably go look up to see what can I expect from this or if there's anything we can do about it specifically, right? Um, in terms of management here, you always want to do a radiograph for this to make sure they don't have any retained foreign bodies. So if a part of the spine broke off or something, you can do an x-ray to look for that. Um, stingray wounds can be so bad, sometimes they even need surgery. So one thing to consider there as well. Um, certainly tetanus prophylaxis. And another thing we can do to help out with the toxins that these fish are injecting include hot water. What do you think hot water is going to do for us? It's like hot as the patient can stand. It actually helps denature proteins, right? So if you have these proteins that are the, the venom itself are, are proteins, you can try to, uh, so that was a vasodilator, no, not necessarily, but yeah, so by giving, and again, it's like hot as a patient can stand, have them, uh, you know, if it was like their foot or something that got stung, um, that can help to denature those, that way they're gonna be less potent or maybe ineffective altogether, which is uh, something helpful there. So again, a little easy thing that, you know, a lot of people might not think about necessarily. And again, just local systemic analgesia can be very beneficial here as well. Um, there is an antivenom for the stonefish. Again, this is not used very, very frequently. Um, again, a lot of serum sickness you're going to see with these full antibodies, oral snake antivenom, black widow antivenom. All these things you're going to see a lot of serum sickness with. And again, that's just treated supportively. There. Um, and that's it. So that's all the marine envenomations worth talking about, at least in my mind. Um, interestingly enough, there is a, you guys ever seen a blue ring octopus? Look up, there's a blue ring octopus, and it's kind of interesting because the octopus itself, it doesn't have any obvious sort of like, you know, jaws or anything, but there's a little beak right in the middle of it. And it actually has uh, tetrodotoxin, which can actually cause paralysis. Um, yeah, so that's one of the things too, is because people like will handle, and they have these blue rings that will light up when it's like, you know, in freaking out mode, uh, usually when people are handling it. And so they sit there and then all of a sudden it bites them on the hand because they don't realize there's a little beak underneath there that'll, that'll get them there. Yep. Yeah. Super dangerous. Yeah, she could have like, yeah, died from uh, respiratory failure. Uh, delicious though. Well, I, I don't know. I've never had one before, Jackson. I couldn't say. It's very pretty looking. Yeah, I can imagine why people want to pick it up, but again, that's why, that's why it tries to, to trick you there, right? Okay. All right, so I got some questions here. Kind of friendly look, looking little spider. He's like doing traffic, air traffic control or something. Okay, um, someone said, do you ever see patients with reactions to centipedes or millipedes? Um, not that I've seen too much. I haven't run into that too frequently, um, other than probably some local reactions. Not really all that venomous uh, to my knowledge there. Uh, someone said, when we say IVIG or antitoxin, are they generic drugs even to many diseases? I thought they were antibody based, so IVIG or antitoxin only fixes one disease. Yeah, no, that does make sense. Um, so when I say IVIG, that means uh, IV immune globulin. That is something that is pooled from people's plasma that they've donated that has then been all pulled together. That is gonna be um, treating a lot of different things, right? Because again, you're getting a smattering of different types of antibodies from these different people. We've not selected out for anything in particular. When you have a specific antitoxin, that is designed to be targeted against one specific product there. So if you think about like with tetanus, there's a tetanus toxoid, that is something that's trying to get us immune to that specific product there, but there's also um, uh, a, a antibody we can use against that specifically. In the case of the uh, antivenoms we were talking about with like snakes, for instance, those are antibodies designed specifically just to that particular uh, venom, right? Or a couple of different snakes, right? Because sometimes it's polyvalent. 
Um, but the point there is to be much more specific. So if you hear IVIG, that can treat lots of things. Kawasaki's disease, um, uh, glomerulonephritis due to like, you know, autoimmune conditions. It can be, I mean, just a ton of different things you can use it for versus antitoxins or antivenins are going to be very, very specific to one thing, uh, one thing only, typically. Yeah. Um, so Alyssa's is asking about, you know, donating plasma after people have had COVID, they've got antibodies. So I think for early on, I think those are specifically for research purposes. They're trying to figure out like what the antibodies were specifically looking for, which is how we know that, you know, okay, they're looking for that spike protein. So it seems like it's a good target for like our um, uh, uh, vaccines and whatnot. Um, now, if you have people donating plasma now, you probably do have some people who were COVID positive, have developed antibodies, and that, that now would be included. So would that provide any additional therapy to COVID in the future? I don't know, but it's a good thought that, you know, yeah, you might get some of those antibodies lumped in there with everything else. So time goes on, it's probably more, more and more likely to see that for sure. Okay, uh, someone said, should we write our RSI meds as milligrams or should we write mLs since it comes as a two milligram per mL solutions? So uh, unless you're doing like a fluid that is specifically done in mLs, keep everything in milligrams, right? Because depending on where you go, Drugs may come in different concentrations, right? So not every morphine comes in the same concentration, not every ketamine comes in the same concentration. So by you guys putting specific doses, whoever is then going to be drawing up that med will then figure out how many mLs to give, whether it's pharmacy, nursing, or whoever else is gonna be preparing that. Um, so, because if you're in like an RSI situation, someone's gonna say, usually the provider who's ever at the head of the bed, or foot of the bed, is gonna say, atomidate 40 milligrams rock uranium, 60 milligram, whatever the case is gonna be, that's what they're gonna be calling out. And then whoever else is gonna be preparing that and then giving it will be using the MLs, right? So say, okay, here's, and normally like when I was like in those code situations, um, I would be like, okay, I'm handing over the drug to the nurse. So I'd say, here's rock uranium, 40 milligrams, four MLs, here you go, right? And so that way she knew she could look at it and say, okay, this is what this is uh, before giving it to the patient. But you as the providers, stick to milligrams, unless the drug is specifically done in MLs, like fluids. Okay, make sense? Uh, short, oh boy, okay, let me see here. Uh, one time I was collecting eggs from a chicken coop after dark. I wonder if we can like start to like social engineer and figure out who this was based off of, like, <laughs> who's, who's a farm history. Uh, someone crawled into my long sleeve, bit my wrist, and then up my forearm, bit my elbow. That time I held on. I uh, felt like a lightning bolt shot in my entire arm to my shoulder and the side of my neck. It left behind little fang bites. My entire arm felt numb, tingly for the rest of the night. Hurt so bad I wanted to saw my arm off. Hopefully they didn't. Do we have any one-armed people in the class? <laughs> I'm like, okay, no, okay, so you kept the arm on. Uh, even though it only looked mildly pink and swollen around a bite, just pure nerve pain. To this day, I had no idea what it was that bit me. The pain lasted uh, well into the next day. I didn't go to the ER because I didn't have health insurance at the time. Um, yeah, that could be a number of things. It probably either sounds like perhaps a caterpillar, but usually those aren't moving too fast to shoot out the arm. But I don't know. Interesting. Huh? I don't know. I'm, I'm glad they survived. I'm glad they kept both their arms. That's fantastic. Great. Um, can I show you guys something real quick? If you'll indulge me, I found some of my old pictures during fellowship and stuff of just like interesting talk things. Hopefully you guys don't mind. People at home hopefully won't mind either. Um, okay, so I have a, another PowerPoint here that I, unless I lost it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the heat, yeah, so again, um, if the sand is, you know, been compacted around the, the thing, it would provide pretty similar benefits uh, from that standpoint for sure. Okay, here we go. So, um, anyway, so let me show you a few, few pictures here. So, um, nothing too crazy on here, right? I know some of you guys are probably looking at that, that, wind, the, the file explorer, like, oh, the test is right there. If he just accidentally clicks on it, we can see it. No such luck. Um, anyway, so here is an example of a canebrake rattlesnake. If you can imagine how big this snake is, I mean, that's the body of it there being held on by, you know, two, two grown men. Um, what they would do when we would come by to do our visit, they would bring the canebrake out and they place them in this plastic tube. So that way the head was far up enough to where you couldn't actually get out and like bite anybody, but we were still able to, you know, kind of see how it feels and see how big it is up front and things like that. Um, he was very angry about having to do this because his rattle was just going crazy. I mean, it was like kind of like a buzzsaw going off. So I was like, we could put him back. And they're like, no, it's great. We do it all the time. So it is what it is. But you can see his head there. Uh, I would not want to get bit by 
that one, cause like rhabdo, all kinds of bad stuff. Not, not great. Um, this is Dr. Rumack from the Rumack Matthew nomogram. So this is my one celebrity photo. I got the nerd out. I was, I was actually like, taking pictures like from across the room. Huh? Exactly. So he, has, he always wears a bow tie. A super nice guy. I got to meet him once or twice. Uh, very, very nice. Yeah, I was definitely starstruck. But unfortunately, he did not have his uh, paparazzi like blocking glasses or scarves or anything like that. Um, here's an example of a, a foreign antivenom. This is not FDA approved drug that we had to use for a foreign snake bite. It was a patient that was bitten. I think this time it was by an Egyptian cobra. Um, so we ended up having to go to the zoo, pick up the antivenom that we could use for that. So it's hard to see. You have another picture of the, the box here. But it's called the Samir antivenom, and it's designed for a variety of different types of venomous snakes from South Af or from Africa, the Africa continent, basically. So um, we've used this before for things like you know mamba bites, like black mambas, um, Egyptian cobras. It, because it is polyvalent, it works for a variety of different uh, types of snakes there. Hmm? A handler, right? So typically, if you see a foreign snake, so uh, to give you a bit of background, um, I'm sure you guys have heard the the meme Florida man. These are usually Florida men who are doing this, but uh, essentially, what you end up seeing um, is that it, the the exotic snake li or the exotic reptile license in Florida is exceedingly easy to get. The requirement is that you have to prove that whatever uh, reptiles you have that are venomous, that you have to show that you have the anti uh, anti venom for it, right? Makes sense. In case you get bit. Well, what a lot of people will do is they will say, well, you know, I have a, I have a, you know, a pit viper from uh, the North, North America. I have, a, I have a rattlesnake here. Well, every hospital has crofab. So obviously if I get bit, I can just go to the hospital and be treated. So they say, sounds good, here's your license, and then they can get whatever they want. So if they want to get a black mamba, legal. If they want to get uh, you know, a taipan or an Egyptian cobra, all legal, they can do all of that, right? So that's why we end up seeing some of these envenomations here because Florida is a little bit wild in terms of some of its laws, right? Um, I was saying, sorry if you already covered this, antivenom often kept on hand at places where bites are common, such as zoos or sanctuaries. Um, yeah, so every zoo, so there's like the American Zoologic Association, they have to carry antivenom for every venomous um, reptile that they carry. Um, so for instance, if someone came in with a bite from a, a snake that they did not actually carry, they may not have the antivenom for it. So in some cases, we have to reach out to different organizations. We may either have to go to like a different zoo, or there's actually something called Venom One down in uh, Miami. They actually have specialized because they carry just about every single anti-venom in the world, and they've been, uh, th I think they had a, a TV show on TLC for a time. Uh, I don't remember what it was called, but it was basically they would travel out to these different places uh, with their anti-venom and, and be able to treat these patients with these exotic bites. I think their one claim to fame is like on 9-11, they were the only plane that was allowed to fly that day after the attacks because they had to be uh, carrying anti-venom out to like California or somewhere from Miami in order to treat this patient. Well, that's apocryphal or not, but that's what they said. I thought it sounded pretty wild, so I said, okay, well, I'm going to tell other people this. Propagate the story. In Snake Land? Um, they, they, they have to. Well, so in Florida, they, they oftentimes do not because of the fact that they were able to skirt the law by showing they had a, a, you know, something like a, you know, an Eastern, Diamond, or a Eastern Diamondback, you know, something easy you can treat in a hospital versus something exotic. Just, yeah, zoos are okay. They're under the AZA, so they're able to, to carry all kinds of stuff. But they do have the antivenom for those snakes. They have to have that. And then they have a medical director sign off on that. So like my medical director at the Poison Center also signed off on their antivenom at the Jack's Zoo. Get a relationship with them because of that. Um, who could be authorized to administer at those places, or would they just be sent to the ER with the antivenom? Yeah, so they would typically come in um, to us. So whether it be, you know, I've never had a zoo uh, person get bit and come in because they're trained professionals, but um, certainly the handlers will come in. If we have to use something like this, we make sure that we like go through um, uh, every legal hoop possible to absolve us of uh, issues. You know, we have them sign that they say, this is not FDA approved. Can I guarantee this is not gonna kill you? Are you okay to receive this? And they say, yeah, you know, our family member will do so. Um, yeah, so it's pretty wild stuff. Um, so here, here's the box that came in, so you can kind of see it's refined equine serum globulins. Uh, right there I saw equine. I know that's going to be a big risk for anaphylaxis. This person actually got bit a second time by, I think the second time was by a black mamba. So he ended up having a reaction the second time he got this. So he actually developed anaphylaxis secondary to getting this one time, then he got it the second time. So again, uh, be careful of snakes. It's not great. Um, here's an example where uh, we actually used do not wear gloves. I think gloves sometimes won't even help them in some cases, or they get them on the forearm or something. But um, yeah, they, may, they, may get, they get pretty familiar with these snakes, unfortunately. Um, here's an example of us using gastric lavage to help uh, treat a patient. So we talked about GID contamination, that being one of the cases there. So this is a really recent ingestion 
uh, someone who had a radiator fluid uh, ingestion. So they were trying to harm themselves. They drank a bunch, bunch of this, but they were really close to the hospital. We got them in within a couple of minutes, um, and we were able to pump some of this out of their stomach. So that helps to limit some of the exposure. Again, this is not really common that we do this, but this happened to be a special circumstance. So again, if you see fluids that look like that coming out of a patient, something weird is going on, and that was the case there. Here is an example of some potpourri you can put and, and help help your uh, you know your place smell a little better. This is actually um, back when um, the synthetic cannabinoids started to come about, the uh, K2s and spices and things like that. This is one of those brands uh, that a patient had come in with. They were having a really severe reaction to it. Um, could you think like you know pot? Not really that dangerous. Most people have a pretty good time when they're using it. Um, this stuff was really, really nasty because it was able to have really unintended effects on those cannabinoid receptors, it caused patients to have severe um, hallucinations, seizures in some cases, all kinds of bad effects. But this is what they would come in with. And you could get this at the gas station at the time. You can get them from anywhere. You notice here, it real small print says, not for human consumption. But of course, people knew what they were buying it for. And so they were smoking these things and having all kinds of, of problems associated with that. So. Again, I don't know if they actually got the Hanna-Barbera license to use that, so maybe there's a legal case on that in hand. I don't know, but we, we got rid of that. Um, here's an example of another um, thing we saw where basically this uh, patient was collecting venom from his snakes. He's a handler, uh, and he was trying to uh, sensitize himself and become immune to their venom. So you can see the vials where he would actually be collecting the venom and give himself small injections. Well, he ended up having a bad reaction one time. And notice here, he actually even puts like, hey, attention, if you come across me and I'm unconscious, take me here, call the poison center because we knew the guy really well. We treated him so many times. They were like, just get me in contact with these people because they'll be able to take care of me. Right? Because you have rain. Huh? It's, it's wild. I mean, there's probably even more than, than what I'm including. This is just stuff I have pictures for it, right? We, I mean, we we're pretty good at what we do, so, you know? Yeah, oh yeah, that guy's still alive, I'm pretty sure. Might be in jail? I'm not sure. Huh? No, he, he, that's why we're treating him. That's why he's at the hospital. Well, that, that's the point. People have, uh, and it's been reported, people have done that to where, like, you know, one guy, like, famously says he's immune to black mamba bites, even though those are some of, like, one of the more dangerous ones out there. Um, but yeah, so it's just, you know, obviously, people doing this at home, you know, Googling it and seeing, okay, I can do this, and it's like, no, no, you can't. Um, so this one isn't a strict tox ingestion, but this was a patient who had severe mental health issues. Uh, it was in a, um, a facility, uh, and he really wanted to become strong. And so he said, well, what do people do when they want to become strong? Well, they pump iron. He said, well, if I eat a bunch of iron, then perhaps I will become strong as well. This is the logic here. So anyway, so he ended up ingesting every nail, screw, anything he could possibly find. If you notice here, like, this is his stomach. Notice it's almost, well, all the way down to his pelvis practically, right? Pretty wild. This is a lot of stuff that he was ingesting here. So obviously his uh, chief complaint, abdominal pain. You do the x-ray and you find this is like, ooh. Fortunately, no one put him in an MRI. Otherwise, he would have looked like a porcupine, I imagine. That not been great. Anyway, so we sent him to surgery. So again, it really wasn't tox related necessarily, but I thought it was interesting to see a different type of ingestion. Um, but here's all the stuff they pulled out of his stomach. Notice here a few Star Wars figurines, which I thought was interesting. Maybe they give him the force or something. I don't know. Um, yeah, so it just wild the stuff that people will do to themselves uh, sometimes, especially if they have, you know, untreated conditions. Um, need them for D&D. &D. I, I think we got rid of them after that. I don't know if anyone collected the, uh, the miniatures. Um, this was a patient, I think I mentioned this story before. So this is someone who had overdosed on the drug Azo, used as a urinary an um, uh, anesthetic, uh, and had, if you notice, if you've ever taken Azo before or seen it, um, it causes a very, like, orangish, reddish sort of urine uh, coloration that has that. Well. As I mentioned, it also can cause something called methemoglobinemia. So this patient had developed methemoglobinemia, normally a blue skin. You see that, it looks like cyanosis, even though they're breathing fine. Um, and so we end up giving the antidote, which is methylene blue. So we give a blue dye to a patient that converts methemoglobin back to oxyhemoglobin, turns it red again. So in this case here, it's kind of interesting because we give a blue dye. And notice it starts out red. Notice it's kind of coming out kind of a purpley color. So we had the blue dye plus the red from the azo kind of combining together to get purple urine. So. I think that was the Prince song, right? Maybe? <laughs> not sure. And that's all the pictures I could grab in about 10 minutes or so. I know, but. I don't. This was an acute ingestion. It wasn't like an acute on chronic sort of thing. So she was trying to harm herself and took whatever she could have at hand. So uh, it was an unknown amount, but it was enough to at least cause a pretty significant methemoglobinemia. So 
uh, one guy that was drinking some uh, some friends lost a bet and had to swallow a bunch of razor blades come in and chief complained of vomiting bloods they didn't know why interesting uh, people out there yes for sure um, I mean you have people that will have incarceritis so they're in jail they want to get out of the jail go to the hospital so they'll do things to themselves so that's kind of the colloquial term I don't know if it's very sensitive but it's what we called it um, and so like one guy came in with uh, you know, difficulty peeing is because he put a razor blade in his urethra so now it's you know yeah so now it's like a urologic thing we got to deal with and just yeah wild stuff people will, will do there so anyway enough of that so let us begin where's my button just classic do it so we still got to do a review so I'm gonna use most of my time here can't let you guys go early on my last day you guys can see the uh, here. I'll see any new sticky notes. I think we're good there. Yeah. Yeah. So Alyssa's asking about the um, how do they actually like, milk the snakes to get the venom out in the first place? It's milking is, is the the term they use. Um, so typically they'll have, and you can find videos of this online. There's a there's a really cool serpentarium in um, in Deland where they'll do like live uh, milking shows. They do this down in Saint Cloud too at their serpentarium. So you can actually go and w witness it if you want. Um, and they'll, what they'll do is they'll have uh, usually like some kind of glass vessel that has some sort of like saran wrap type of substance over it. It will then take the snake by the head and then have it kind of whip its fangs out and they'll have it pierced through that that saran wrap and then it will just kind of naturally leak out its venom uh, and then they will collect that. So interestingly, like, you know, like, well, why do they do that besides like trying to inject themselves? Most of the time it's actually for research purposes. So for instance, the guy in Deland, he was uh, collecting it. He'd freeze dry the powder or turn it into a powder, freeze dry. And then he would um, basically uh, use it, uh, send it over to labs who buy it from him in order to develop things like a new coral snake antivenom. Cause that was during the period of time where we didn't make it anymore. Right. So once we're out of supply, we're out. Um, so in those cases there, he would um, actually help to, to make new antivenom in that case. So it's kind of interesting. I farm. Really? Oh, really? Yeah. I met someone uh, from Australia one time, and I was asking them. I was like, "Is it really like that? That nuts over there? Like the wildlife?" She said the birds were the worst part. Mm. A dive bomb? Yeah, yeah. I couldn't like go out of the house sometimes. Yeah, she said it was pretty, pretty wild. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fortunately, we don't see too many of those oh, right yeah, now. Yeah, the magpies, that's what it was, yeah. 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 <laughs> Not very nice. All right. Every food. They crikey a lot. <laughs> I actually did. Funny. Like kookaburras. All right, well, let's get started here. Someone trolled me so hard a few years ago saying that drop bears were a real thing in Australia. I don't know what a drop bear is. What does it depend? Yeah, the dude, dude in Delant is buck wild. I agree, yes. he was, He's pretty cool. Okay, let's get started here. Another question. We have about an hour left, so. All right, inactivated vaccines cause which type of immunity? Uh, would it be active, passive, booster, or innate? All from the trees, you had to wear a hard hat so you didn't die. Hmm? Yeah. You're still alive, so you have your head intact, which is great. Um, right, so anytime you have an inactivated uh, vaccine, you're still producing a, uh, a response against that, right? So when do you get passive immunity against something? Like breast milk would be a good example when you get passive immunity, what else? Um, or more, more likely, um, yeah, like antivenin would be a, a, a type of that, but more often things like you know, immune globulin is what we think of as well, where again, you're providing the, the protection for the patient, they're not producing it themselves, right? Um, now again, when you're talking about things like, you know, 
how strong of a response you're going to get. That's when you get into the delineation between like live attenuated, where you get a much more strong response typically than something like an inactivated vaccine, right? Because the live attenuated ones are able to still replicate. So you get much more of a, uh, more of a natural sort of infection as opposed to a killed variety or just a portion of the virus or bacteria itself there. So one thing to note. Very good. A uh, patient with a history of malignant hyperthermia can safely receive which paralytic? And they get succinylcholine, vecuronium, rocuronium, or cisatricurium. Yeah, it's this thing, right? He, it was like actual physical trauma that, that was his downfall, I believe. I think he had like pretty significant abdominal trauma related to it. Um, you know, but most people that step on it, so they usually have like some kind of leg injury associated with that. But yeah, I think he must have had some massive, and again, I don't know how big of a sting rate it was or, or not, but yeah, that's at least my understanding. But I didn't dive too, too deep into it. I thought it was abdominal trauma, but I could be, it could be wrong there. Yeah, I thought the bar uh, shot through the chest abdomen. That's, uh, that was my understanding as well, Isabel, so. Um, anyway, so yeah, so with you have a history of malignant hyperthermia, really any neuromuscular blocker is safe to use as long as it's a non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocker. So that includes all of them, VAC, uh, rocuronium, cisatricurium. Um, succinylcholine is the only one that would uh, trigger that, right? Because they have that mutation, that ranidine receptor rotation uh, mutation that would cause them to have issues with receiving succinylcholine. So that's why you would avoid uh, that particular drug there. Uh, someone had a question. Uh, someone said, is the exam an equal distribution of all the PowerPoints? Pretty close. I tried to make it. Um, I think the uh, the HIV uh, slash STD one, the um, uh, tox and ER ones are a little bit heavier weighted, uh, and then the immunizations and Jerry's a little bit less. So, but it's pretty close within two or three questions of ten a piece, basically. So, hopefully that answers that. So, unfortunately, stuff to study for everything. So any non-depolarizing neuromuscular blockers, okay, if they have that history of malignant hyperthermia. This is why a lot of people, because you may not know if they have that, that history, that, um, you know, especially if it's an emergent situation, um, you may have people who just default to say, well, I'm just never going to give succinylcholine. And that is fine, right? For some people, that's fine. But then, you know, you'll find, especially a lot of newer providers, they, they, they typically will avoid succinylcholine because they don't have to think about it as much. It's easier to say, well, just give them rocuronium, and then I don't have to think about it. Nothing wrong with that. Oh, great. Rock, rock, suck, sucks. Yep, that's it. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, Bactrim is used to treat which opportunistic infection? Uh, candidiasis, PJP pneumonia, cytomegalovirus, or Mycobacterium avium complex, or MAC? Does anyone know of the only venomous um, mammal? on Earth, also native to Australia. The, the only venomous mammal. Uh, yes, the platypus, there you go, very good. Yeah, the, the platypus also has a barb that it can sting you with as well. They lay eggs too, like it's just, it's real weird, like, yeah. Uh, anyway, so yeah, so looking at um, Bactrim being used for PJP pneumonia, that's like a really common one because again, as their CD4 count drops, or if you have a patient who's like receiving chemotherapy, as their neutrophil count drops, this is the first thing you're going to think about because it's the most likely thing to happen as they start to drop down. You know, stuff like MAC, you don't really see until they're down much, much lower. Um, you know, things like cytomegalovirus, you don't see that till much lower. But again, you always want to think about, do they, this patient need Bactrim based off of their risk factors? So what's their CD4 count? What's their neutrophil count? That's one way you can sort of... Um, do that. So I like to harp on that because it's, it was one of the more common things you'll see. Uh, let's see what's How would you adjust the dose of rosuvastatin for a patient taking ritonavir? Do they want to use the same dose, decrease the dose, stop the drug, or increase the dose? I always tell the hard questions because I hear the chatter start to die down a bit. <laughs> They're like, ooh, which one? Ah, see? 
The one person. Uh, anyway, so um, the thing with this is remember what your interactions are. So what am I asking about when I'm looking at Ritonavir? What kind of interaction can that cause? Comes a SIP, right? So you probably guessed SIP 3A4. Very good. It's a strong 3A4 inhibitor, right? So that means that it can lead to boosting levels of all drugs that are metabolized through SIP3A4. This is a good thing for certain um, uh, antiretrovirals. So for instance, like uh, lopinavir, that we put that with ritonavir to boost it up so the patient doesn't have to take as many doses throughout the day. But you're gonna see interactions with other things because remember, the protease inhibitors cause a lot of metabolic complications like hyperlipidemia. So you may need to treat that in addition to their HIV. So the question is, what do you do in this case here? Well, you can always find a statin that doesn't go through 3A4 and guess what those two are that we talked about mostly? Suvastatin and atorvastatin. Those are the two big ones you want to be focusing on in terms of having the most efficacy, but also they don't really go through as much 3A4, right? For suvastatin, it's probably the safest one of the bunch there. Simvastatin, though, I would definitely avoid in that case there. So in this one, you could use the same dose, no problem. So simvastatin, you'd want to either stop the drug or reduce the dose, depending on the situation, right? Very good. Yeah, the level will be boosted, you can see hepatotoxicity, your rhabdo can occur, so that's why you'd probably preemptively drop the dose if you're gonna use it at all, right? But you know, it could be a cost thing where you have to use it potentially, so. Most of them, no. There's some like the, some of the wimpier ones, I think like fluvastatin doesn't have much in the ways of CYP3A4, but when you're looking at overall efficacy, like we mainly are focusing on those higher potency ones like rosuvastatin, atorvastatin, simvastatin, all of that, right? Remember, there's like a high potency and then medium potency one, so we're uh, kind of delineating between those. All right, snake, sad face, spider. Goodness. Oh. oh, I'm sorry about that. Yes, I, I'll continue to do that. Um, I'll try to go back and back around to that one. Anyway, uh, neurosyphilis would be most uh, appropriately treated with which medication? We do aqueous penicillin G, azithromycin, ceftriaxone, or benzathine penicillin G. Yeah, sorry about that, Isabel. I will do some. What was your last question? Already gone from my mind. Yep. Yeah, so so um, Alyssa was saying, you know, so if you did give simvastatin, would that cause level to be boosted and can cause like rhabdo and whatnot? Yes, that, that would potentially occur. Yeah. Okay. So talking about syphilis here, um, again, typically penicillins, it, you're good to go, right? Because it does retain activity against uh, syphilis, which is great. However, you want to think about like what is this a simple case of genital syphilis? Is this going to be a case where it's more like systemically involved? If that is the case, these are very sick patients. They're probably going to need continuous aqueous penicillin G, right? So IV penicillin, they're going to be getting continuously. If it was like a one-time thing, or if it was a very un, you know non-involved case, you could just do that benzathine penicillin G because what's the benefit of using bicillin? I am, but what's the duration of action of it? Yeah. It's just one dose, right? Because it has a really long duration of action. It has that kind of milky base that it's in, that lipid base. It causes it to slowly release over time. Uh, so because of that, it lasts for a long time, just like Jackson said here. Um, and so you can end up giving just a one-time dose. Because in the name of the game when treating STIs is typically what? You want to be one and done, right? You just want to do one dose, if at all possible, which is why some of the things with like uh, chlamydia, for instance, is getting challenging because of the changes that some of the recommendations are making using like doxy versus azithro, for instance. Um, so that's kind of the, the things you'll see from that standpoint. Um, okay, very good. Let's make a question here. I said, uh, could you explain the mechanism behind why you can use sucks for the first few hours after burns and other stuff, but the CI after the time period? I think it was four hours, don't remember, haven't studied yet. That's okay. Um, <laughs> so it's two to three days for a lot of those things. So crush injuries, burn injuries, um, any sort of like spinal cord injury, or if they have a long-standing neuromuscular disease like ALS or something like that, then it's, you know, it's always going to be present there. What happens in those cases is they have an upregulated a number of acetylcholine receptors. So when they, that uh, succinylcholine comes along and activates those receptors, it's going to hit it extra hard. It's going to be even more depolarizing, and that's going to cause even more potassium going flooding out of the cell and can cause arrhythmia. So that's why we say, okay, two to three days after the, this injury, that's when you had that upregulation. If it happened just now, right, so if someone had, um, for instance, just got, you know, pulled from a house fire, they had significant burns, they need to be intubated, you could still give them succinylcholine. You're within that time frame of two to three days, right? Now, will some people still default and say, let's just give rock uranium? Probably, that's fine. And you can do that, right? There's nothing wrong with that. But again, good to know because you may be in a situation where sucks is the only thing you have and you need to know, is this safe for your patient to get or not? All right. Yes. Yep.
Yeah, so, so for you asking about, um, you know, if you had a little bit more involved, maybe not so severe as neurosyphilis, but uh, I think a lot of that has to do with, and you know, she's asking what was the delineation between using like the benzathine penicillin versus um, the aqueous. If they're sick enough to where they need to be coming in to the hospital, like you're probably gonna be using the IV formulations, right? Because you get better systemic bioavailability, you're gonna get much uh, uh, more consistent doses there. If it's something where they're gonna be outpatient, just use the bicillin and then that's fine. Hmm. All right. Uh, patients hypotensive and bradycardic, which presser would be best suited for them? We want to do milrinone, epinephrine, vasopressin, or dobutamine? I used to like looking at myself when I'm on these, but I got everything else up here, so I'm like, I don't even know if I have a booger hanging off my nose or something. <laughs> Very strange. All right, interesting. A little bit of a, a split here between the two. So um, in this case here, the patient's hypotensive bradycardic. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to kick up the heart, right? We need to get more contractility out of the heart, or at least get the, the rate up. Uh, but we also need to try to get the pressure up, which will somewhat be helped with the contractility increase from some of these drugs. But really, we need vasoconstriction to happen as well. If you remember with dobutamine, what's dobutamine's main action? It does increase heart rate, but improves cardiac output because it is a beta-1 agonist. That's all it does, right? It's just going to be a strict beta-1, so it doesn't help really with the blood pressure at all so much. Versus some like epinephrine, I know it's going to be activating our beta receptors, or alpha receptors, so you should see a rise in both of these, right? So for instance, if I had uh, a case where like a, a beta blocker overdose had occurred and I needed to get their pressure and their heart rate up, then something like epinephrine might be something I'd be more likely to recommend. On the other hand, if I had like a TCA overdose, something like amitriptyline, and they were tachycardic, but hypotensive, then something like norepi, which is just gonna be more so focusing on the alpha receptors, might be a better option there. So again, we kind of pick which ones we need based off the cardiovascular status of the patient there. That makes sense. Vasopressin really wouldn't help out the heart rate. Milrinone would help out with the cardiac output, but what would milrinone also do? Dilate, so it drops the pressure, if anything, right? So that's why you'd be good for like a decompensated CHF where they're hypertensive. And the cardiac output's really low. You could use milrinone to help out from that standpoint there, right? Again, you'll see questions like this on the test where I'll put scenarios and you have to kind of pick which one's the best option out of the bunch there, right? Uh, someone said, can you explain why aqueous penicillin G is better when, when, when you use a one-time dose of the bicillin? If they're so severe, they're having like neuro complications of the syphilis itself, we need something that's gonna be able to get really high concentration, consistent levels. And so this isn't a one-time dose sort of thing. This is something that they're gonna be put on like 24-hour um, uh, continuous infusions of the penicillin until it gets sort of um, uh, treated there. So that's why you wanna go more intensive, go with the IV form versus just using an IM shot once. And so, so if the patient was in an earlier stage of syphilis, then uh, penicillin G, IM have been okay. Yes, I think so. Depending on how sick they are, if they're going to be going home, then yeah, you want to stick with the bicillin. If they're going to be coming in-house, then probably you're going to go with the IV, um, uh, IV penicillin there. How often that is? Not too, too often. So most of the time, yeah, you're probably going to be defaulting to the, the uh, uh, bicillin there. Yep. All right. Uh, patient V-fib cardiac arrest has not responded to defibrillation. Which med can be used? We've got this rhythm there. Do we give amio, adenosine, lidocaine, or digoxin? You're going to get well versed in this over the summer when you have your ACLS week. It's a really fun week for you guys. So you guys get to do that. All right, very good, right? So the key points here we're focusing on are what type of arrhythmia is he having here, right? What is patient patient's having? Is it more atrial in nature or is it more ventricular? Because it's more ventricular, we know they're in V, v fib. We wanna go ahead and treat something or use something that's gonna be able to treat the ventricles. And really in this case here, is not gonna do it because it would only work for superventricular tachycardias. Um, lidocaine may be used in some cases, but that's not normally recommended first line by ACLS guidelines, right? Like we saw in the, those algorithms there. And then digoxin is not really going to be much help of us either because this patient's not AFib. In this case here, amio is always going to be kind of your default in those cases there. So if you want to do like a chemical cardioversion for a ventricular arrhythmia, amio is kind of your go-to, right? 
But again, you can use Amio for atrial stuff as well. So for instance, if you were using adenosine for like an SVT and it was failing, it wasn't working, you could potentially use Amio for those patients there. So that could be another option as well. Do you have a question? So you're asking for pheochromocytoma. What's the rationale for doing alpha uh, blockade before beta? So that goes back to something you'll hear a lot with, uh, and again, I'm, if I'm thinking the right thing, I don't know, I've not dealt with a ton of pheochromocytoma in my, my days, but the rationale I can think of um, is that they're in this really hyperadrenergic state, right? So their sympathetic nervous system is kind of going crazy. I think about that similar to like cocaine, and you'll hear that with cocaine ingestion, you'll say don't ever do beta blockers for those patients because there'll be an unopposed alpha constriction. What that means is, is that normally beta-2 receptors provide some degree of vasodilation, right? So someone's in pheo, they have a lot of epinephrine, norepi that's swimming around the bloodstream causing alpha receptors to be activated to squeeze, but also the beta-2 receptors are activated to cause a little bit of dilation, right? If I take away that beta-2 effect by giving a beta blocker, I'm gonna get all that squeeze happening there from the alpha receptors alone, and that can cause hypertensive issues, stroke, heart attack, et cetera, right? So that's why I said do the alpha blockade first to try to loosen up those vessels and then give the beta blockade and that way you get a nice balanced effect, right? So in the case of like uh, something like cocaine, you probably don't want to do something like propranolol by itself because you're going to run into issues with that unopposed alpha. But if I did something like nitroprusside plus a beta blocker, that can then provide kind of both benefits from that standpoint. So that, that would be my reasoning. Um, but they might have something else, but I think that's probably what, what you're referring to. All right. Now the sticky. IV penicillin for more severe cases are the aqueous. Well, the aqueous is the IV form, yeah, so that's why we're going to go stick with that. Uh, someone said, can you explain what milrinone does again? Absolutely. So milrinone is going to be a phosphodesterase inhibitor, right? Not PDE5, because then you'd probably use it for like erectile dysfunction. But PDE3 helps to work for cyclic AMP in the heart and on the blood vessels to cause some degree of vasodilation. So it increases cyclic AMP in the heart, which causes increased contractility. In the blood vessels that causes vasodilation to occur. So if you have someone who is hypertensive, but poor cardiac output, so like a, a decompensated CHF patient, they just weren't perfusing anything, um, then you can give them milrinone to boost up the cardiac output, but also relax on the afterload by decreasing the uh, vessel constriction there. That makes sense. Uh, which of the following signs and symptoms is consistent with cholinergic poisoning? The bradycardia, urinary retention, constipation, or mydriasis? You can go back to your mnemonics, this will help you out. Um, you're asking about milrinone and rogam. Oh, oh, so so you're talking about uh, minoxidil. Oh. Or Rogaine being used for hair growth. Yeah, that was a vasodilator originally, but it's a really bad antihypertensive because your RAS system is just has too big of a compensatory mechanism there. So they, they but they did see it works for hair growth. So mm -hmm. very good. Um, right. So cholinergic poisoning. Remember, you got too much acetylcholine affecting both muscarinic and nicotinic receptors. Remember, for your muscarinic symptoms, what's the mnemonic we used? Dumbbells, right? So defecation, urination, meiosis, bradycardia. Um, bronchorrhea, bronchospasm, emesis, lacrimation, salivation, right? So you're leaking fluids everywhere. But also all that acetylcholine is affecting the heart, causing bradycardia to occur there. They wouldn't have urinary retention, they'd likely be incontinent, right? Uh, they wouldn't have constipation, they'd likely have diarrhea. Uh, they would not have mydriasis, unless it was just the nicotinic effects, so it's not most consistent, you're more likely to see the meiosis from that. Right. Very early on you may get the mydriasis, much more likely you already get that bradycardia. Uh, from that standpoint there. Uh, what's the ratio of elemental calcium and calcium chloride to calcium gluconate? The 1 to 10, 1 to 1, 1 to 3, or 1 to 5? Try to pick up the pace a little bit because I know we're kind of behind. 
Um, right, so it's one to three. That means for every one gram of calcium chloride, you need three grams of calcium gluconate. So you gotta take that into account when you're comparing the doses because, um, again, if you see like calcium chloride is like 10 mg per kilo per dose versus calcium gluconate is like 20 to 30, a little bit higher even. So again, it's that ratio there because if you call, hey, give them an amp of calcium, you may be getting a third of what you want or three times as much as you want, depending on which one they pick. If you don't specify, then they may pick whatever they want. You think everyone would come back and ask you questions, but they don't always do that, unfortunately. Uh, which of the following only work when the HIV virus expresses a CCR5 receptor or is looking for that CCR5 receptor? Be Maraviroc, Nelfinavir, Elvitegravir, or Adizanavir? Go back to your mechanism. Very good, Maraviroc, cells entry. You kind of think of it, it says like entry in the brand name, so you kind of think it needs that CCR5 plus the CD4 to like get into the cell, so that's how I kind of think about it from that standpoint. Um, but again, if the virus is mutated where it's not even looking for that receptor anymore, then it doesn't matter, it's not gonna be a factor for, for that particular type of um, uh, strain of virus, unfortunately. A uh, patient with SVT that didn't respond to adenosine could use which med to control their rate? So we could use amiodarone, amlodipine, esmolol, or norepinephrine. Again, controlling the rate of the SVT. I'm going to talk about the emphasis of that particular syllable. Maybe you fell into my trap. 17 of you did. Wahaha. Um, right, remember we talked about rate control versus rhythm control last semester? I know most of you probably pushed that out of your minds, but that's okay. Um, in the case here, you can kind of go through two different mechanisms. You can either try to convert their rhythm back into sinus. Obviously, adenosine didn't work, so you could use something else in this case here. You could use aden or amiodarone to convert them back into normal sinus. On the other hand, though, if you just wanted to slow down their rate, to get the, vent, uh, get the ventricular rate under control, because that's the thing you're worried about. You're worried about their ventricle tiring out and then they don't have any more cardiac output. So by slowing down the rate, you could do something like a beta blocker to, to do that, right? So again, think about what you're trying to accomplish. Are you trying to convert them back to normal rhythm or are you trying to slow down the rate? And that will lead you to what you're gonna use there. And lodipine really wouldn't help out there because it would cause vasodilation. Norepinephrine, if anything, would do what to the heart rate? Increase it, right, because it's gonna cause some more beta one activity to increase that rate even further, so you would not want to do that. Justin Bieber's here? That's fantastic. <laughs> a patient with a history of malignant hyperthermia can safely receive which paralytic? Uh, vacuronium, oh, I already had this one. Oh my goodness. I doubled, yeah, you better get it right if I doubled up. Jeez. Oh my goodness, yep. At least no one got it wrong, that's fantastic. Good job. <laughs> I hope the beads got it right. Like, you want me, you want me to repeat some questions on the exam? All right, I'll take I'll take that under advisement. Then not do it. Which patient can receive succinylcholine safely? Uh, severe burn that occurred last week, spinal cord injury that happened three hours ago, crush injury three days ago, or hyperkalemia and renal failure? I've already given this one away too. How nice am I? Actually, the person who asked the question on the sticky board gave it away. So there you go. Very good, right, so the time frame is what's important here. Severe burn last week, more than 48 to 72 hours. Uh, crush injury occurred three days ago, that's 72 hours, not gonna be good. They already have hyperkalemia, this can then worsen that, right, because we know it's gonna cause potassium to rise, it's just how the drug naturally works. Uh, they have renal failure and they're already hyperkalemic, this is just gonna exacerbate that, I guess you don't wanna do that. So in case here, spinal cord injury three hours ago, they're still safe to get it, because they haven't had time to upregulate all those uh, acetylcholine receptors to make them more sensitive to the effects of succinylcholine. Uh, which of the following signs and symptoms is consistent with sympathomimetic poisoning? Expect to see urinary retention, constipation, mydriasis, or bradycardia. Similar answer choices, but now we have a different toxidrome we're talking about, so what do we think?
So you're asking if I had a patient who is, uh, was on dialysis regularly and they needed to be intubated, would we do succinylcholine or maybe something else? In that case there, I'd, I want to ask, like, what's their potassium level right now? If it's normal, then I'd feel safer about giving, because remember, we're shifting the potassium. We're not adding any more to the body, right? The body stores is what it is. We're shifting it out. It'll go back in eventually. So if their potassium is like three and a half or four, that's probably fine. Probably not going to cause a problem there. If it was six, obviously, I'd be a little bit more concerned from that standpoint. Um, again, if you don't want to think about it, then you could use like rocuronium. And it sounds like I'm trying to tell you, to, like, just don't use succinylcholine. But again, it can have its place. You just have to be much more careful with that particular drug versus your other parallel. You have to be careful with all of them because, again, you can kill somebody with any of these, right? Because you stop them from breathing, they're going to die. But in this case here, you're going to see that with succinylcholine, you just have to think more about it, about what is going to be most appropriate based off of the patient condition. Anyone can get a, a non depolarizing neuromuscular blocker. That's why it's much easier. But again, people have their preferences. Um, in this case here, it's in pathomimetics, we're thinking like cocaine, amphetamines, things like that. You're probably not going to see a lot of constipation, maybe a little bit of diarrhea, but not nearly as bad as like a you know, cholinergic poisoning. Um, urinary retention, you're probably not going to run into problems with that. If anything, the heart rate's going to be what? Elevated, they're going to be tachycardic most likely. Uh, but the mydriasis, you can certainly see that, right? So you can see the anticholinergics, and you can see that with some pathomimetics. Big saucer looking pupils. Pretty cool if you uh, ever get to see it in someone. Uh, Maybe not in your personal life, but if you see like in the ER or something, you'll see that and it'll be like, wow, this, you know, even if it, it'll be like, wait, why is it so bright in here? It's because like, their pupils can't constrict, they're letting in all that light, you know? Okay. Uh, what's, uh, what sucks at advantage is relatively short half life. That is the reason why, why we would use it, is because of the relatively short half life. Um, rock uranium is probably going to be a little bit longer than that, but again, if you're talking about in the grand scheme of things, it's probably not going to make that great of a difference. Uh, but like I said, when we were um, opening up Nemours and we were trying to figure out, like, well, what do we do for standard of care? What do we, what drugs are we going to use for what? Um, our chief, who is an older guy, wanted to use succinylcholine because of how short it was acting. Everyone else is like, well, we're younger and we've always used rock because that's just what we've used, and so they wanted to stick with that. But of course, you know, it start to butt over things like that. But that's that's typically why people like that. I'm gonna try to finish on time. Hold you guys over. Uh, which drug would finish this HIV regimen? They're on zidavidine, imtricitabine. What else could I add on to this? Tegravir, lopinavir, ritonavir, abacavir, or etravirine. Again, this is the word soup that you get with HIV drugs. You're like, wait, what category does this fit into? So, challenge. Very good, there was multiple correct answers, right? Because remember, for that regimen, right now, what, we, what do we have here? Well, we have two NRTIs, Zidavidine and Imtricitabine. So we need to add something on from a different class in order to complete the regimen. So we could either do an integrase inhibitor, which would be rel uh, relvitegravir. We could do a protease inhibitor, like lopinavir plus ritonavir, right, using to, to boost up the levels there. Or we could do etravirine, which is an NRTI. Adding on a abacavir would not be useful because that's another NRTI. Right, so that's why you got to be able to kind of delineate which drugs fall into which categories to be able to get an appropriate regimen. Because again, I, like I told you, I'm going to put a test question on there. This is one thing I will give you. So say which one of these regimens is appropriate. And so if it has three protease inhibitors, that's not going to be appropriate. If it's going to have three NRTIs or something, that's not appropriate. So you got to be able to figure this out. Okay, and that's the challenge. You got to know the names. So we, when you see them, you can recognize them. Because um, again, like even if you were to like look at not even lay eyes on a patient, but just look at their medication list, like you can already tell a lot just by seeing one of these meds on there. You're like, okay, I have to think about some stuff. This patient has HIV. You know, they're coming in with cough. Could it be something related to you know their opportunistic infection? Like you always get your mind going down on uh, the right pathway when you see these sorts of things. And you can recognize them. Okay. Uh, someone said to clarify: Is milrin both a positive inotrope and a vasodilator? That is correct. That's why specifically we use it in CHF, especially. You don't really see it used much outside of that. Um, it's not really too useful elsewhere. Not to put it more succinctly, if I tried. Okay, which of the following would not be indicated for a bite from the following snake? Which would not be indicated? Uh, the North American coral snake antivenom, tetanus vaccine, rabies vaccine, or crofab? Hmm? No animal pictures on the exam. <laughs> I do have a picture. 
but not of an animal. How about that for being cryptic? <laughs> right, so what kind of snake was that? Anyone know? Is it a coral snake? No, remember, what's the, what's the mnemonic we use there? Red on, red on black, venom lack. Red on yellow, kill a fellow. Okay? Some people say red on black, venom lack. Again, just don't get close enough to have to worry about it. But, uh, yeah, that's going to be like a king snake. Um, you'll see corn snakes and stuff may have similar sort of coloring patterns there. But this would be non-venomous. They're not as easy to tell because they don't have like a big triangle-shaped head or the big elliptical pupils or the big hypodermic needles. So that's why it's really tough. And people would see something like this, and if they didn't know, they could pick it up and then accidentally get bit by a coral snake. Not this one, but uh, something that looked very similar to it. So that's why we've got to be careful. So again, you wouldn't need, need to use any anti-venom. And do snakes commonly carry rabies? They do not. No, it's mostly mammals are going to be able to carry that, not uh, reptiles. Uh, but the tetanus vaccine would still be recommended, right? Because again, still break through the skin there. Who knows what's been in that snake's mouth recently? I probably wouldn't venture to guess. But again, tetanus might be indicated for that patient there. Okay. Nice to have a celebrity in the class. Pretty cool. Uh, which patient would produce the best response to an inactivated vaccine? Uh, someone with HIV slash AIDS, 14-day-old infant with no medical problems, 16-year-old female, or 6-year-old male with under active treatment for leukemia? Who would get the best response to an inactivated vaccine? Probably an easy one. Right. So I kind of made it easy, but I'm trying to drive the point home. Um, so some of the HIV slash AIDS, they may have immunocompromisation that keeps them from having as good of a response to an inactivated vaccine. Remember, with the live attenuated, could these patients get vaccine with live attenuated? If they're immunocompromised, then I probably would not do it. So the patient with under active treatment, I probably would not want to give a live attenuated. If it's someone with a normal CD4 count and good viral suppression on HIV AIDS, they, they could probably go ahead and receive a uh, live attenuated. It's probably not going to be a big problem for them. Um, what about the 14 day old? Yeah, they don't have their own immune system yet to really uh, be able to deal with that. So, um, but in the other cases here with a, with a uh, inactivated, they can still get these. They just may not have as good of a response, right? Uh, in these cases here, so you'll still see inactivated vaccines being used for infants. You'll see them used for immunocompromised individuals. Just know, may not get as good of a response. That's why we see a lot of repeated doses of those. Um, well, on the other hand, though, 16-year-old female, she's going to get the best response out of that because no complications, has a good, competent immune system. Assuming nothing else was wrong with her, there you go. Right, so they get the best response. Uh, in the old, the elderly, uh, which system keeps most of its activity, but drug-drug interactions are much more likely? The GI tract, the kidney, the liver, or the pancreas? They don't call them old, but character limits to deal with. So in the elderly. Very good. So remember, with all these other systems, they're going to be degrading over time, right? The kidney function is going to go down, liver function is going to go down. The GI tract still pretty much works like it should. The problem, though, is you're going to have people taking more drugs, they may be altering their diet, and you're going to see much, many more interactions because of that. So just something to think about there. GI tract still works pretty well, but you're going to see issues in terms of like, you know, drug drug interactions, if, they're on, uh, if they have osteoporosis and they are on a bisphosphonate, they may interact with their, um, you know, the hypertension meds, they can interact with X, Y, and Z. So again, that's why I gotta be really careful from that standpoint and really review those med lists to see if there's any alterations you can make to make sure that things are gonna be absorbed like they should be. All right. Nope, rope in the lead. Uh, in elderly patients, which of the following would be considered intelligent non-compliance? We've kind of talked about towards the end of there. Um, taking a BID medication daily to save money, applying a second patch when the first one is still attached, uh, forgetting doses secondary to Alzheimer's, or not being able to swallow tablets due to dysphagia. Kind of straightforward, but I drive a point home. Yeah, very good. So again, when I'm saying intelligent, I mean they're not doing what they're supposed to, but they have a reason why they're doing it. They're doing it on purpose. They forget to take doses because they're losing their memory. That's not their fault necessarily, right? Or if they apply a second patch and the other one's still on, which you'll see someone occasionally or someone routinely. Um, but yeah, so if they are on a fixed income, they want to make their meds uh, last longer, they may say, well, I'll just take it one time a day. Right? And then if you go to ask them, well, are you taking it twice a day? And they're going to say, 
Mm -hmm. Because they don't want to, they don't want to get the, the the talking to from you, right? So, um, but uh, you know, you may be like, "Why is the drug not working like it's supposed to?" They say they're compliant, and that can be a, a challenge you kind of have to work with. So, again, fostering open communication is really important for those type of patients. There. Right. Which of the following would identify a venomous snake in Florida? Red on black coloring, elliptical pupils, striped banding pattern, or rounded head? I get this one away already. Actually, a funny story, you know, we talked about like the anal plates uh, being used to, to be able to identify a venomous snake or not. Um, one time we had a patient come comes in for the snake bite. They had decapitated the snake. They brought the body in, but not the head. So it was kind of difficult to tell, was it really a venomous snake or not? And so my attending, Dr. Kunisaki, he's our medical director. He's like the smartest dude I ever met in my life. He comes walking into the ER, you know, kind of strolling in, has coffee in his hand. And uh, he's like, oh, what's going on here? And the attending tells him about the case. And they're like, we have no idea if it's venomous or not. We don't know if we need to give Crofab. Uh, and he's like, well, you said he had the body of the snake? And he's like, yeah. He's like, well, let me see. And he's looking at it. And he goes, oh, non-venomous. He's like, well, how can you tell? He's like, well, if you look at the anal plates here, you can see that they're uh, <laughs> level road. And so, and, he go, and the attending goes, Tom Kunisaki, you're the only person I know that can look at a snake's butt and tell me if it's venomous or not. <laughs> I always thought it was a very, very funny story. Um, anyway, yeah, so elliptical pupils, they have those cat's eyes like pupils. Good indication that's going to be a venomous pit viper here in, in Florida. Now, with the coral snakes, they don't have that though. They're still rounded pupils. But that, at least if you see a snake, elliptical pupils probably stay away from it, right? Well, well Brian, I guess that's the way to put it. <laughs> anyway, uh, patient undergoing. <laughs> A uh, patient with bradycardia undergoing intubation should receive which medication? Rocuronium, epinephrine, atropine, or adenosine? You guys get this guy kind of loose with the, your other professors in the chat? <laughs> I don't know if I'm, is it, it's a class thing or is it just my class thing? So, just me. The Brian thing. There you go. Yeah, probably Kaplan. I can see you guys getting kind of a little loose with him. Oh, boy. <laughs> I'm not going to repeat that for the online crew. Wow. He doesn't, he doesn't respond to your jokes, does he? Uh, okay. Yes. He's got that deadpan humor down for sure. You all have just different styles as well. It's okay. Uh, you appreciate humor more than most others. I think it's only because I'm on Reddit. Probably I, I keep a little bit more in touch with the, I feel like the uh, the fellow kids is like, good day, children. Like, how are you? Like, good day, teenagers. But. You're not teenagers, but you get the idea. Uh, anyway, meme culture is, is a thing. Um, right, so if they're bradycardia, so we're talking about pretreatment for RSI. Remember the two meds we talked about, lidocaine and atropine. If they're bradycardic, then you can give atropine beforehand. Some people will go ahead and pretreat, like especially kids, if you're getting sucks on the colon because it's pretty common that it causes uh, bradycardia as well, so you may do that preemptively. Um, when would I use lidocaine? Very good. Yeah, so if you're worried about like intracranial pressure being a problem to prevent rise in ICP, um, so total uh, traumatic brain injury, cerebral edema, you know, you had a, a messed up VP shunt or something, like anything like that could be a reason why you want to avoid increasing ICP. So lidocaine is the pretreatment of choice for that one. Very good. Uh, let's see. Two more. Uh, naloxone is to morphine as blank is to diazepam. Give you flashbacks to your SATs. You get physostigmine, flumazenil, atropine, or ethanol. Never took it. I did AC. I guess so, yeah. All right. So, um,. Flumazenil is the antidote specifically for benzos. Not all sedative hypnotics, specifically for benzos. When would I use physostigmine? I know. Very good, Marley. Anticholinergic poisoning. So if I had someone with like a Benadryl overdose or someone who had gone into like, you know, angel's trumpet or something, um, you could use physo to try to block that acetylcholinesterase enzyme to increase acetylcholine levels, and that would then kind of get them back to normal sort of functioning there to some degree. Um, when would I use atropine? So if they're bradycardic, but bradycardic due to what? We're thinking antidotal therapy. 
It's very good, Alexis. So cholinergic poisoning. So like that organophosphate, or if you had like a nerve agent or something, um, in, in soldiers would actually carry this with them. There's something called um, I'm trying to, what that uh, Mark One kit they would carry along with them if they were deploying over in areas where they thought they might have exposure to uh, potentially you know nerve agents and things like that. They would have a, a kit with them. They actually had two syringes, and one of them had atropine in it, and the other one had the drug Tupan we talked about, right? The pralidoxine. So in case they got exposed to some, they even didn't know what it was, they could pre-treat themselves with these intramuscular injections of the drugs and that would help to prevent them from becoming ill, right? Um, so kind of an interesting thing uh, you can see there. Anyway, so ethanol, obviously that would be bad because that would worsen the effects of the benzo, so you don't want to do that. There's some people have done that, a lot have. Uh, some said, how specific will you be on the names of the different insects and marine envenomations? I'm gonna make it fairly straightforward in terms of that. I'm not gonna ask you like really nitty gritty details and like which uh, fish falls under the family Scorpindiae or you know, like, nothing like that, but mainly like how are we gonna take care of these patients? Is there any like, kind of obvious treatments for them? Things like that are we're gonna be looking for, right? So like you mentioned like, you know, um, the hot water. Like that's a, a unique thing that didn't really pop up anywhere else. Maybe that's something that'll come up. Or for instance, if there's a particular anti-venom, that might come up. You know, things like that, they're sort of unique. So that's what I would say to that. Uh, which plates mean the snake is venomous? Double row, I keep missing it. Uh, I believe it's the double row. Again, I don't usually look at them either, but uh, it's one of those things you'll see there. So, bro, I believe I have to look at the slide. I always forget it, because again, I don't try to look at snake butts too often. That probably will not be on the test specifically though. So I can tell you that much. That one particular point, the other stuff probably will, but you'll, who knows. We've got to finish the test. Uh, last question here. A uh, patient receives an inactivated vaccine today. Which of the following are true? He can receive a live vaccine next week. He misses his next appointment. He must restart the series. He needs to wait at least six weeks before the next dose or can only receive other inactivated vaccines today. Double row is not venomous. Yeah. I was going to search for it, but then I didn't want my account to be flagged on the university system. <laughs> you know, there's a double row is uh, the non-venomous type. So single row is going to be uh, venomous. Yeah. So I apologize. See, again, so some of the stuff even I gloss over in the details. But um, right. So remember when you're talking about getting different types of vaccines together, what can you receive on the same day? Anything. Like you can get live, you can get inactivated, you get them all together, no problem there. Um, if you receive a live today, how long do you need to wait before you get another live one? Four weeks, at least four weeks between the two there, right? Um, and again, if it's different doses of a live, the same live vaccine, you gotta wait at least four weeks between two doses of the same one. Okay, so that's kind of the, the minimum time frame uh, you're gonna see with that. Typically, if you miss an appointment and you get a little bit longer, that's okay. It's not gonna make you restart the whole series there. Um, and then, yeah, so you can, you can get any of the vaccines together at the same time, so that's not, no problem there. Very good. Uh, let's see, one question over here. For the farm assignment, should I be worried about giving a patient that's had a seizure automate since it has myoclonic activity? That's a good thought. I never thought about that. Um, generally, no. Um, you're not really going to run into issues with that. The other thing, too, is what are you following up after the automate? Paralytic, right? So you're going to be given a paralytic. That's going to deal with any kind of like muscle activity anyway. So it's generally not going to be too big of an issue you're going to see with that. But that's a really good thought. I didn't really. I uh, thought through that. We've given plenty of uh, seizing patients um, automate. I've never run into an issue of it causing any sort of like trismus or myoclonic issues in terms of um, uh, preventing the intubation from occurring, right? Other than just normal anatomy kind of stuff. But uh, you guys are awesome. Thank you for being so nice. Let me see who the winner is. If I had to guess, probably guess. Number three is Justin Bieber. Oh, the Beebs coming in. I don't know who that is. This will be a row. And then. Nope, bro. Who's nope, bro? And it probably <laughs> Isabel, right? You should be like, it's probably Isabel. Like, you should be yeah, nice. Isabel, very good. It's supposed to be rough. Oh, okay. This will be rough. Yeah, it might be rough. Well, at least I know who Brian, that one is. Who's Justin Bieber? Is it actually him? Sure. Is it one of you? Were you Justin Bieber? Oh, uh, they're going to remain anonymous. Oh. oh, Heather, very good. Nice. Nope rope was Isabel. Nice job. You guys are awesome. Who's, who's Justice Beaver? It sounds like a superhero. Justice Beaver. Um, okay, so yeah, you guys are awesome. Thank you so much. Um, 
Any questions I can answer before we, yes, yes. So, so good question. So Priya's asking about, uh, is there a contraindication between succinylcholine and cocaine specifically? That's kind of interesting because of the fact that um, they're both metabolized by plasma esterases, right? So that's how they're both metabolized. Now, some people have deficiencies of that esterase enzyme, meaning they're going to be slower at being able to metabolize things like cocaine and potentially succinylcholine. There's no direct interaction between the two together, so I would not say that it's a direct contraindication. Right, um, but it's not going to worsen any effects of the cocaine. So I don't think there's any specific contraindications. But um, again, if you want to avoid it, non-depolarizing can be another option there. So it really just going to be dependent on what uh, what you think is, is the best option there, or whatever you want to prescribe for that particular patient. <laughs> what? Yeah, he's like I already did it, so that's fine. Uh, what other questions do you have? So this is it for me. So you'll have my test on Monday. I know, and I was so sad. But I'll see you this summer, so I'll be doing the pub skills course. I'll still be, I might do like a lecture or two for the Clinton Farm. Hopefully we'll be able to come in person again. Um, and yeah, so if you have any um, thoughts or comments or anything, like I really do read those evals. Those do, I do like kind of pour over those and every one of them um, uh, either makes me feel really good or like really horrible. I'm like, oh, this person had a bad experience. How could I? Um, but uh, I, do, I do really like constructive criticism. So anything I can do to try to improve the class for the younger generation, right? It doesn't help you anymore, but it can help others. Uh, please let me know. Um, hopefully we won't be all distant anymore. Hopefully we'll be in person for the next time around, but we will see. I'll, I'll still be here. Don't worry, I'll be around. I know, I'm sure, I, I, you, don't have to, you don't have to tell me lies. It's okay. Um, otherwise, you guys are free to go. Thank you so much. If you have questions, email me. Remember to email me early rather than later so I can get back to you before the test on Monday. Hopefully notes on Monday. Okay, so I'm gonna,